Okay, everyone, uh, let's get started. It's two o'clock, people will be coming in. So it's my pleasure to introduce Darko Marinov. Uh, he is a professor at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And uh, just to quickly introduce him, he has published more than 100 conference papers and any kind of award that you can think of in terms of paper, he has it. Distinguished papers, impact papers, most influential papers, test of time awards, everything. He has all of those. So I will not go into like trying to introduce him more. Uh, and his research is in software engineering, specifically in software testing. And today he will be teaching us, telling us about flaky tests and how to deal with them. So without further ado, please, well, please join me in welcoming Narco. Thank you, Ter, for the introduction. I guess you mentioned you forgot my Kai Best Paper Awareness. <laughs> uh, yes, I'll be talking about the combating flaky tests. If you don't know what flaky tests are, I'm going to introduce them in a minute. This starts going. Worked last time we tested. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so they rise in the context of developing software. So here's a brief introduction, kind of how people write software. Developers write some code go commit and push their changes, some version control, like you know, something like GitHub. Uh, then there is some continuous integration servers that get these changes, and then they compile your code or build, and then they start running tests. So all software organizations run this, uh, whether they're kind of more open source organizations or more proprietary software that they build using various kinds of these uh, build systems that they have in their organization. So usually this kind of testing we refer to as regression testing. You already have existing tests and you're just running them to check if your changes broke something or not. So what you get is the outcome here is for all the tests that you were running, whether they pass or fail. So if all the tests pass, then developers are happy. They can merge their changes and go you know, drink beer or something. But if something fails, then uh, developers are not so happy and they need to go and debug these changes. Um, so it look kind of reasonable if, if my all the tests pass before the changes and the tests fail after changes, then the bug is due to changes. However, that's not always the case. So there are tests that we call flaky, which can non-deterministically pass or fail even for the same code version. So if they pass after changes, it does not mean that the problem is with the changes. The problem is maybe some other things. I'll be talking today about some of them. So besides the fact that tests are flaky, there are other kind of problems in this whole development cycle. So one is that this testing can take a lot of time. If you have thousands of tests, if you run this uh, frequently, um, for example, here are some numbers for this from a few years ago, relatively old, but uh, these are some in the millions that uh, big large uh, organizations like Google and, and Facebook run. Uh, and also tests can still miss bugs. Even once you run all of this, uh, these tests that you already have can miss to find bugs that can be in principle found with the, with these same tests. So my group has done work on all of this. So when I say my group or we, that means students do the work and just come and give talks and you know wave hands. <laughs> it's one of the students of Olabi. He's actually worked on that part, how to find more bugs. Basically, if you have already existing bugs, how to squeeze more value out of them, how to find more tests from there. Um, August has done this work on uh, trying to speed up this testing and also to increase the reliability to address some of the flaky tests. And uh, Wink has just uh, graduated very recently, he just uh, joined George Mason. A number of you have ties to George Mason. Uh, he has worked on flaky tests. Actually, a lot of slides that I'll be using are also from, from his work and uh, August's work. So once more, basically what the flaky tests are, what's the definition is kind of tests that can non deterministically pass or fail even exactly the same code and the same test environment. Now what that means the environment is not exactly the same. If everything was the same and the world is perfectly deterministic, we are not running quantum computers or anything, uh, the outcome should be the same. So something here does change. There is some non-determinism, but it's not so easily under the control of the developer or tester. I will see later on some longer list of causes, but it could be things like concurrency, random number generator, time of the day. There are various reasons uh, that can lead to, to such failures. So if developers make the change, now some tests fail, 
well, sometimes they can pass, they can fail for exactly the same code version. So if you're a developer and start getting experience with these flaky tests, it's really unclear what you should do. Uh, if you just made the change and the test just failed, is the bug due to your changes or not? Do you need to debug? Do you need to revise that? Or can you just ignore simply these uh, test failures and say, my changes seem to be fine. I'm going to merge and uh, go grab my beer and someone else should go and deal with that. Basically, these flaky test failures are a big problem in software development for the following reasons. They mislead developers about changes, so they don't get a reliable signal. Are the changes correct or not? Did you break something or not? Waste developers' time to debug uh, very often the problems not in the places where they are. If you're a new developer who's never seen these flaky tests, you may go and debug your own change just to find after quite some time that the bug is not there at all, but uh, it's some old test that someone else wrote and it fails for a completely different reason. Then as you get more senior, you can just get more skeptical about that, the whole regression testing that's done at your organization and reduce the trust in that, that if it tells you, you know, fail, you don't trust that it's actually failing. You believe that your changes are good. Just kind of out of curiosity, how many people have heard of term flaky test? She asked the other question. How many people have not heard of the term flaky tests? Okay, two, three, fine. How many people never raise their hand? <laughs> sure, unless it's the most raised hands in the classroom setting for undergrads at least. Okay, so I'm telling you that these flaky tests are a problem, uh, but you know, maybe you don't trust me. So here are some blog posts that I took uh, from various organizations, the real blog posts, I did not Photoshop them. So this is Google saying flaky tests are a problem. This is Microsoft saying flaky tests are a problem. This is Mozilla saying flaky tests are a problem under a different name. Sometimes they're called intermittent tests, uh, flapper tests, erratic tests, uh, unreliable tests. There are various terms that various organizations use. This is Twitter saying something about tests. Uh, this is Dropbox saying something about that. And this is Salesforce also saying that flaky tests are bad. So written by a former master student of mine, so I don't know how much I trust that one so for full disclosure. Um, also, these companies, at least the big ones that have uh, money to waste, they're also writing the research papers about this, uh, this problem and uh, describing uh, how they encounter flaky tests and how they deal with, uh, with that. So besides blog posts and papers, they're also willing to invest some funding into this topic. This was a call for uh, proposals from Facebook but they've specifically singled out this uh, test flakiness as a big problem for them. And they have asked for uh, people to send some proposals. So we got some money from them. It's not much money, but okay, it's better than nothing. So here are some numbers that, uh, that uh, are reported in some of these papers or blog posts. For example, Google a few years ago said that they have 4 million tests uh, of which uh, about one sixth were flaky. So at some point sooner or later, they saw exactly the same behavior that you run it multiple times for the same code, the same version of the code, and then sometimes they pass and sometimes they fail. Um, this is another one from Microsoft. Again, they reported some 82 million test runs that they've done uh, within uh, one month for a number of uh, projects where the study was done. And of those uh, few thousands uh, were flaky. So here the ratio is more than kind of one in thousand uh, runs actually flakes out. You get the failure that's not due to anything that you change in your software, but just due to this uh, uh, flaky test having some source of non system that's not properly controlled. But even if you get this relatively infrequently, one in thousand per test, so what that means when you run this large number of tests uh, per day, uh, then very frequently you actually encounter things like that, and they lead to the waste from, from developers. So my group has been working on this topic of flaky tests for a while. We started in 2014, I guess one of the first academic groups to go and write about this. Uh, problem has been known kind of industry for a while, but I guess uh, people do the real work, they don't have time to write papers. So we write papers for them and uh, we hope to get uh, more people on this uh, bandwagon and to study this problem and to address uh, some of these issues. Uh, recently, there was a, a survey that was published, uh, it listed uh, over 70, 80 papers that are working on the topic of flaky tests. And here are some from us about characterizing what these flaky tests are, to know whether certain failures are from flaky tests or not, some techniques to detect them. That's what I'll be talking about today and some to fix them. I'll be also touching on that. Actually, I fix flakies will be the first topic I cover. Um, and we have more ongoing work and so I'm also open for collaboration. If you think that flaky tests arise in your domain, 
Be happy to chat about that. Uh, besides publishing these papers, we also occasionally release code the issue that takes some time. So it is one of the changes that uh, Bing Lam, a recent graduate, uh, has, has done to include something called Surefire. It's a widely used tool for testing in the Maven world. So Maven is this the build system for Java, and this is kind of the most widely used uh, testing framework for that. Uh, but things like that takes you know six to 12 months to get any small feature included. They always tell you how they have some milestone and something is planned in the future, and they're going to add your stuff and they get to it. So something it's a bit trickier, frustrating to work with the large software organization. Okay, so I told about flaky tests, kind of as a reminder once more, non deterministically pass or fail. So, what are those causes of pass and failures? Well, one is test order dependency, and I'll be focused on that today. I just want to point out that's not the only cause. Uh, very often, when I finish the talk, people think that flaky tests are only these test order dependency. That's not the only thing. We'll see what this means. This means that as you change the order in which you run tests, uh, they may start passing or failing. Uh, there are other things like uh, unordered collections. You may have a set of elements and then you iterate through the set. It does not have a defined order. There's no specification that says you must get them in a certain order so it can lead to different behavior. Floating point operations, if you deal with some more scientific software and then usual thing with the floating point operations not being associative. Uh, randomness, if you have random seeds, uh, concurrency, asynchronous communication, resource leak, network, simply if your network is up or down, your test may pass or fail, and so on. So what are the order dependent tests? Uh, well, as the name says, it's kind of, as you change the order, they change the behavior. Maybe I run all the tests in one order, they all pass, and then I flip them, and now one of the tests fails. Can be the earlier one here as a test two, or, or it can be the, the later one as a test one. Either one of these can fail, in fact, even both can sometimes fail. Um, and so we would like to find these early in a, before the developers actually encounter them, before they make their code change and the test fails because the order changed, and to point that to them such that they can fix that in advance. Now, of course, you can say, well, maybe one way to fix them, just simply run them all in the same order, never ever change anything, and then you are done. But the problem is you cannot always do that. For example, JUnit uh, is also widely used testing framework for Java has notoriously changed the order of the test between Java 6 and 7. So there are a lot of reports about failing tests. So people do stuff like parallelize uh, the, how they run tests. So then the order can change or which subset of tests you run together. People run test selection, prioritization. These are all kinds of techniques that actually change the order or do not even run all the tests. So our problem then is how do we fix and how do we detect these order dependent tests? So let me show a concrete example. Kind of bear with me here. There's a lot of code, but uh, I'm just going to explain the relevant parts. So this comes from some open source project, something called Wildfly. There are two tests here. They're called test bind and test permissions. And uh, if you run them in this order, they pass. But then when you flip the order, one of them fails. So the test permission one fails. So we have some names for this, but let's not worry about those names. Um, the question becomes how to fix that. So what do I mean by fix? You know, kind of, well, there are many ways to fix. For example, I can delete test permissions and say, now it's fixed. Now it cannot fail because it does not exist. But that's not quite, you know, the fix that we would want because if I have a real bug, then these test permissions cannot find that bug. What I really want to do is somehow preserve the logic of this test, um, but change it says it can be run independently. It need not run after test bind. Since whenever I run it after test bind, I can run it many times, it deterministically passes. The moment I flip that and I run it before it fails. So any idea for how we could fix this? So I don't want to delete the test. I don't want to fix the order simply because I cannot do these things in various settings. Okay, I can follow the data dependencies, and then and then what? And then we're sure that uh, the right order is always followed. Okay, so yes, I would somehow need to follow the data dependency, and ensure that I get the right order. Um, so basically, here what happens is there is this shared state store. So this test actually somehow updates the store in one way, and then this one uses that store in another way. 
And uh, indeed, there is some data dependency. These two tests actually share some state. And the fix somehow conceptually, it's already in that test bind. The first test that runs, it has the fix. It's somehow, it already sets the state in such a way that the second test can pass. Because if I literally get all these lines, uh, three lines plus uh, three dots, and copy paste them here at the beginning of this test, uh, then this test permission can pass even by itself. Simply run. If I run it, I don't need to run test bind anymore before it. I just copied all the logic, everything the test bind does there. And now the test permission can pass by itself. Does this make sense? This would be a way to make, of course, this would be a rather suboptimal way. Uh, you know, this test bind may have 50 lines of code. I don't really care about uh, 49 of them. I really care just to capture this the state change that actually creates this dependency and sets up the state of the system in a way the test permissions expects in order for this test to pass. Basically, I would not want to simply copy paste this, but I want somehow to minimize this, uh, this change and create a smaller change uh, such that the test permission can run by itself in isolation. Uh, this was actually the easier case. Any questions about this case? So the case here was two tests pass. When I flip them, the first one fails. Um, unfortunately, the easier case is not all that common. This other one is more common. Here, what's happening again, we have two tests. You don't need to worry about the details of all the code. Um, we run these two tests in one order. But now when I go and flip the order, it's not that the first one that fails, but the second. Um, and now I'm going to introduce these terms because we are going to use them throughout the talk later on. Um, we call this one test polluter. That's this one here, because it goes and somehow pollutes the shared state. It changes the shared state in a way that this other test does not expect. So this other test we call a victim because it's kind of a poor victim that uh, runs in a state that it does not expect. And because there is this polluter that changed the state, uh, now the victim fails. So now then the question is, how do we fix these polluters and victims? Yes. Um, reset the state before returning the victim or after it? Okay, that's an excellent idea. That's exactly what we want conceptually to do. So basically there is this polluter, it goes and does something. Uh, I, I think here it fails because of uh, whatever, this job registry changes. So I would somehow want to somehow clean that state. I would like someone to say here, job registry dot clean, um, either at the end of polluter or at the beginning of victim. I would like to say, well, do job registry dot clean, and then you can run your own test. You can check your own logic. But uh, maybe let me add one more thing. You know, I don't want smart students to do this. I want a machine to do this. How can you automatically do that? If you're not student, I apologize, but take it as a compliment. You look young. <laughs> How can machine figure out that what it needs to do is to conceptually run this job registry dot clean or something like that and to restore the state in between polluter and the victim? You know, where should I look for that code, for that cleaner code that I need to run um, for my test? So the answer is that very often such a code may be already in the test suite. Not that it's intentionally written in order to clean this stuff, but someone else is using that code for something else, for something completely different. In this particular case, there is yet another third test that's kind of very long. You don't need to worry about any of the details, but it does have some of that cleaning. So in particular, it does this stuff at the end here, where it gets this instance and some shut down something. So this third test exists. And if I run polluter and the victim in this order, then the victim fails. But if I in between put this third test, all of a sudden now victim is going to pass. So I first run the polluter, it goes and pollutes and changes the shared state. Then I run this third test, which somehow cleans the state. It restores the state back into what the victim expects. And then the victim can pass. So we call this test a cleaner because it comes after polluter and can clean this, uh, this state and then make the, the victim to pass again. 
So the main insight then is that such cleaners may already exist in the test suite. And what we want to do is actually search for them, find whether they exist. And if you find them, then we want to see how to minimize all of this to do the cleaning. We don't want to copy paste this, whatever, 15 lines here. So that's how the machine is going to do this. And we'll build this tool called iFix Flakies that does that work for us. Uh, the main insight is that the logic for setting and resetting states already exists and you just need to search for it in a in a smart way so how does this the tool work well it takes as input two things it takes the passing order in which all these uh, tests pass and then the same set of tests but in some failing order when some of them fails it does its own magic and we'll be looking into what it does and then eventually creates the patches and tells developers hey if you had one line here or two lines there or these three lines here or there uh, then your tests will pass even when you run them independently or even if you run them one after another so this thing has uh, two steps uh, one is the minimizer that gets these orders and tries to find uh, which of these uh, tests are really responsible for that to identify these polluters and victims and cleaners and then the patcher that makes these patches kind of as small as possible such that developers are hopefully likely to accept them well, we said this the inputs and the outputs basically the minimizer is this the first stage gets these two orders passing and failing and tries to find these polluters cleaners and and so on so how does it do that so suppose that i have this order t3 fails and i assume that one of these previous tests is the root cause of the failure so how should i find that root cause Jim, I don't want to interrupt your uh, typing, vigorous your typing. Oh, I see, I see. You're taking the notes of the talk. <laughs> Fine. So the fourth thing fails. How do I find where is the root cause of failure? We could try different permutations. Okay, we could try different permutations. Taking some out. Okay, we can try to take some out. Right? If you try different permutations, it's going to take us some time to find the, the, the thing. If we start taking some out, yes, that, that, that's going to go somewhat faster. You could in principle do something like binary search, right? And just try of this prefix T012. Um, this is the, the focus. So, um, okay, I know that that one is the victim. I may just try one half and the other half. So maybe I try with this half, T2, it still passes. So that's not the polluter. Then I try with the other half, it still fails. So that means the polluter is one or the other, one of these T0 or T1. So I go and try those. And so maybe in this case, I find that when I run T1 and then victim, then it fails. Um, so now very often we get the question, well, what happens if it's not only one test that's polluter? What if you have two tests that you need to run together to pollute the state? And actually our tool does something called delta debugging. It's kind of interesting in academic research, but in practice, we find that this is the simplest binary search works in 98, 99% of the cases. So basically, we found our polluter. So we know that T1 is a polluter. Um, so now the question is, how are we going to search for the cleaner? So I know that uh, T1 is a polluter and that what was T3 is a victim. If I run them as that pair P and then V, then the V is going to fail. So what I would like to see is, do I have any cleaner? Does any one of these other tests can kind of squeeze in between to make the victim to pass? How can we try that? Excellent. So you see, should have you could have published this paper. It's good that I published before you heard of this problem. We do exactly as uh, Jim said. We go and run one by one. In fact, we even run those that are after the victim because they may be cleaners. They just simply in some of the random orders where we found this uh, problem, they may have been after, but uh, we go and run them. So we literally just try each and every one in between the polluter and victim and see do you happen to work as a cleaner? So lo and behold, here we find this that uh, this T4 happens to be a cleaner for this pair of P and V. So when I run P and T4 and V, then V passes. So I know that T4 is the cleaner. Or you try B as one as a possible cleaner? Yes, yes. It seems you are an academic. Indeed, we try the copy of the B as itself and P. And sometimes we find that those work again in one or two percent of the cases. 
which if you omit your paper gets rejected, right? <laughs> because reviewers have to ask the <laughs> most corner case that they can think of, even if it practices their eyes closely to never. Um, yes, you have to try then. That's an excellent question. Uh, I don't mind arguing with reviewers in rebuttals, but my, my students like to have their papers accepted. So for the sake of students, we try all of that. Um, Okay, so now we identify this cleaner, but cleaner may be big, right? So cleaner may have 15 lines. So, uh, you know, if I send 15 lines, developers are not going to like that change. So how do we find a smaller, a smaller patch? So here is my cleaner. How do I identify automatically again, what are the lines that are necessary for this thing to pass? And your search again. Ah, he could have written this paper. Uh, <laughs> yes, the simplest thing work. Very often it's the case that kind of the most simple thing that you can try works the best in practice. Once you're the first to identify the problem, and then you get the award. You know, <laughs> The other people come and struggle and have much deeper algorithms and just improve on your thing. Um, exactly, we do binary search again. We do delta debugging, so you can try uh, bits and pieces. In this particular case, just a simple binary search is going to work. So we say here is the victim that we need to patch. We are going to say before we run the victim, we are going to call this cleaning part here. And then we search to try to see what of this, uh, of this large test actually serve as the cleaner. So we try one half, this thing still fails. We try the other, it passes. And so then we keep splitting this into half. And because we need to finish in an hour, then we find this case. Lo and behold, there's only one line that you need to add. Sometimes these things get messy. You try one half and it fails, then you try the other half and it still fails, which means you need to try some things from each of these halves. Again, there's some very interesting algorithm called delta debugging, something that actually he helps in, in debugging. Uh, and so we've actually tried with that, but the binary search most of the time finds this case again, 98% you know, of the cases. So what that means literally, if you add just that one line there, job registry, get instance, shut down, test job, now, all of a sudden, your victim passes, even when it's run after the polluter, and you can run these tests in any order using your parallelizations, prioritization, selection, and whatnot. Any questions about this? Yes. Um, it would seem to me that these border-dependent polluter victim, like it's a it's it's a symptom of bad developers, like they're like. They should have been doing before each, after each, using JUnit in a way to reset the state each time. Um, so, it aren't the automatic solution? Aren't you in a way enabling bad behavior instead of, say, providing feedback to the developers like this is what you're doing wrong? Like identify the problem and say, rather than automatically fixing it and inserting a line in, into these test cases or whatever like wouldn't it be better to for them to like restructure like the um shut the the job registry thing perhaps that should have been an after each so that every single test case gets the benefit of a white in the state no it's it's an excellent question except some of the patches that we open were like that instead of opening say in three tests one line each clean here clean here clean there you would add some, as you said, before each or after each, and just say clean here. And then it automatically runs for each and every test. For these three where it actually needs, and maybe for some other 10 where it doesn't need and wastes a bit of time to do this thing, uh, but it still runs there. Um, yes, yeah, some of the patches that you opened are like that. Uh, some others where there's only one test that needs to be affected, frankly, we open just this. And the reason being that the smaller your patch, the higher chance that it be accepted. The more patches you get accepted, the higher chance that your paper gets accepted. And so, so then you just do that thing. Sure. Uh, but yes, you're right. You're right. In theory, people need to be taught more about this. I teach some of this stuff in my you know, master level courses, my undergrad courses. And so hopefully my students don't have as many flaky tests, some other students. And hopefully now Irvine students are going to know about flaky tests and avoid flaky tests. Yes. Uh, so I'm asking uh, Alberto from Martins, who's one of our lecturers, is asking on Zoom, uh, what if the necessary code is spread out over more than one test case? It seems like it could turn into a very large combinatorial problem. Yes, yes, that's an excellent thing. The tool then doesn't doesn't quite work. I mean, we can find the cleaner that's, that stretches across multiple tests. 
but we did not evaluate that uh, much because this kind of got good enough uh, results. So, yes. Um, is it possible that when you insert the code at the beginning of another test, it could make it make sure that it always um, passes, and mm. therefore it no longer tests if there's a bug? That's that's a fantastic question. Yes, whenever we make change like this, it could be that we make the test pass, but you said not only when it's run after polluter, but forever, even if you have a bug, it's going to miss the bug. This tool has no way to ascertain that or to even try for that. So we just rely up to the developers. We open this patch. If they like and accept that, then hopefully it's either correct or developer was drunk. But uh, we, we do not attempt to solve that. That's an excellent question. Yes. Please. Yeah, I guess I'll start this question with a social observation, which is when I worked with software systems, I found it's either no flaky tests or many, because as soon as you have one, people, you know, lose ownership over the test suite and you just stop, like, making sure that everything you get checked in doesn't have a flaky test. So I was wondering if you were envisioning, is this like a refactor tool to clean up the situation when it's happened? Or is this like what if this package instead is a gatekeeper? So you can't. To me, it seems like a better idea to prevent people from checking these in by kind of automatically testing these implementations than it is to try and retroactively clean it up. Oh, these are excellent questions. Yes. Yeah, so let me just repeat for microphone if you did not capture. So I guess uh, one question, first one statement was that uh, in many projects, either there are zero flaky tests or many. I agree with that. We've often found that you find one flaky test in say one class or one module. There are many of them around. This goes beyond flaky tests for any kind of bugs. I usually like to say kind of bugs are social creatures. You know, they kind of like to stick together. You find one bug somewhere, some part of code. Chances are there are other bugs around. Much higher chance that they're there than you know randomly distributed, uniformly rather distributed elsewhere. Uh, the other thing, should you try to detect this proactively? If you give me three more slides, I'll answer that. And the answer will be yes. Any other questions? They're all fantastic questions. I love active seminars. Yes, please. Uh, have you found like flaky tests in this? Like you run and you find a cleaner, you run again and you find another cleaner. Uh, that's a good idea. I guess uh, all of us are trained in academia or in testing. I see you've been trained very well here to look for corner cases. We did not in our study, but uh, I, I think that you know it can appear in, in theory. I'm not sure if it appears in practice. We've only run this with your know, Java programs and some. Kind of limited number that students run to get the paper published, but all right. So here's then the list of the things that we've done. So we've um, run this for the fixing. Uh, we've had some prior work that has found uh, some many flaky tests, and so we've uh, run this the fi automatic fixing tool I fix flakies on uh, these uh, 100 some of tests uh, to see whether it can uh, find these fixes and uh, to see whether developers want to accept that or not. So here is something first uh, about these tests. So 100 are of these polluter victim. What that means is when you run the two tests, it's the second one that fails. This is kind of the harder case. 10 were from that easier case. Easier case is when the, the first test fails and this is easier to fix. But as I said, it's not that frequent. So the more frequent case was this one. And so out of these 110 cases, we were able to fix 91. Or rather, the tool was able to fix 91. So then we've submitted the pull requests to, to you know, GitHub for, I guess, 99 out of these 101 tests. Two were fixed between the time we started our study and we finished. So 64 have been accepted, and uh, I guess remaining were pending, so nothing was rejected. Uh, since developers have liked some of these fixes that we submitted. And then for time, unfortunately, here the result is not all that kind of positive. The thing is, when you search for this cleaner, if you find it and then you're happy, you find it fast. But if you don't find it, then it takes you a lot of time. So I mean, here, then it runs, uh, what's this? I guess this in seconds, this run hour and a half. And eventually it tells you, oh, I did not find any cleaner. Uh, so some of these other ones with star, it just simply means it did not find. So if there is a cleaner, you can find it fast. There are often many cleaners then. Uh, but if you don't find, then it takes longer time. But then we just take a simple average. So it looks like we are very good. You know, ah, in three minutes, everything finishes. But it's actually very bimodal. It either works, and then it's fast, or it doesn't work, and it's slow. 
Ideally, you would like the system to be the other way around. If it doesn't work, it kind of tells you immediately, I cannot do it. If it does work, you're fine to wait and then it finishes. But this is not quite like that. You know, if it finds cleaner, it finds it fast. If it doesn't find, then it takes time. And then kind of another question in academia, well, if you generate one patch, why don't you generate more? Maybe there is this one line, but then you have some other two lines and we have this and that. So we've done also experiments with that to actually search, you know, when you have a victim, find not one polluter, but all possible. When you have polluter victim pair, find not one, the first cleaner, but find all possible. When you have a cleaner, generate not the first patch, but all possible patches and things like that. In the end, they were all like very similar in terms of the number of lines, in terms of the changes and so on. So as the thing is, you know, we've burned electricity for you. You don't need to do it. If you have polluters and, and, and victims, cleaners, if you need to search for that, it's enough to find one. You don't need many. Now I press something completely wrong. Okay, press the end key instead of page down. It's HCI, bad design of this keyboard. You see or something? Layout. Proximity of keys should match the proximity of the action. Okay, I was here. So this is the summary of this part about the iFix flakes. So as you focus on this order dependent tests, uh, the goal is to automatically fix them. Somehow the assumption is someone has somehow magically found them. I did not discuss this, how we do that finding, but it's by running these random permutations, searching what happens in various ones of them. And we want to create these fixes, but of course, while preserving the logic, again, not to cut off everything so that the test becomes useless and passes all the time. So the tool that we built was able to fix uh, you know, a large number of them. We opened some pull requests and people accepted. Any questions about this part before I proceed with the next part? Yes, so please. If uh, this uh, I fix blacklist didn't uh, fix uh, this flag attack, so can I assume there is actual bug? Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Most of the time when you have this order dependent test, the bug is not really in the code that you're trying to test. The bug is really in your test code. And you know, if you run two tests in two different orders, they sometimes pass and fail. You definitely have some kind of bug, right? There is something wrong. Sometimes it's indication of a bug in the, in the code under test, but most of the time it just means your test code is wrong. And it has these spurious failures and kind of false alarms and developers are un un unhappy and so on. If the tool fails, it just means that this particular technique that we have is not good enough. In fact, my former student August has an upcoming paper in ICSI 22. Now he's doing you know, good stuff that he's not my student anymore, but they can fix many more of these. You know? So they have some automatic thing where they don't just search for cleaners in the test, but they do some other automatic searching through the rest of the code. They do some automatic generation and all kinds of funky stuff like that. Okay, if there are no more questions. Uh, then let me go to the second part, which could have been maybe been the first part, how to detect flaky tests. And here goes to this, what is the good time to, to find this flaky test? Seems you don't want to wait until it fails. If it, if it fails, you're kind of reactive. It, the problem has already happened and you are finding it there. It's kind of rather late, right? You just tell developers, well, this has failed, but if you're at different order, it's going to pass. Ideally, you want to find this much earlier. Um, so one can try to actively detect that. If I have a test suite, I can just go and randomize the orders. I create random permutations of all of these tests and I go run them and see, does it sometimes pass or fail? If it fails, I need to figure out, is it really because of the order? I mean, I may need to run the same order multiple times to confirm that it indeed passes or fails just purely due to the order and not say due to something else like you know time of the day or network being up or down or some thread interleaving in concurrency took some you know, wrong, uh, wrong choices and so on. Um, so that would be active when you have the test suite, but uh, we've done some work that goes even beyond that. Basically it tries to proactively find this problem before you know that you have the problem. So when we have these polluters and victims, it tries to find that some tests are polluters even when there is no victim yet. Simply say there are tests that pollute the shared state. So in the future, you may add the victim and now they can create the pair and then the victim could fail if it's run after the polluter. So we have this tool called PolDat for pollution detection. And uh, that, that's what, what uh, it does. This kid runs the test, checks the state before and after and sees whether some of the tests pollute that state or not. 
So the reason why I focus on that is because this is the most common case, these victims and polluters, rather than the other case that I discussed. Uh, the goal is to try to find this as soon as possible. Basically, ideally, the moment when developers are checking in some of the tests that are polluters, you want to inform them, say, you are creating the problem down the road. You may want to address it now while this is fresh in your mind. You know what you are doing. You're in the best position to fix this, uh, this issue. So let me show again some example of how that works. This is also from that same project, Elastic Job. Again, something with this uh, job red. Uh, registry stuff. Um, so here there was some point at the time when polluter was added into test suite. There was some earlier commit and it added actually this test. And then some time later, I don't know, a few weeks or a few months later, they actually added victim. Um, and what we would like to do is to find when you have only polluter, the fact that it does change the shared state. So we do that kind of by definition, polluter change the shared state. So what we do is just test for each and every test, run it in isolation and ask the question, do you change the shared state or not? So basically create this, capture the state before, capture the state after. Of course, there are challenges how to represent that state, how to do this efficiently and so on. And then we try to diff that to find, is there some difference? In this case, there is this red blob, the difference between the two states. So how should we represent this state when we run these programs and then how to efficiently compare states are the challenges for this to kind of proactively find that you have polluters even before you add the victims and they as a pair manifest in some failures. Afraid to ask Jim how to do it because he's gonna tell me that out. <laughs> Maybe he read my papers and forgot. Maybe he was a reviewer, who knows, you know? <laughs> okay, how should I do this? How should I compare the state before and after the test run? Do uh, is it Java? Yeah. I do. Is theory. there any other language? I, I, I serialize and then do a diff on the serialized state. Okay, very good. So basically, that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> Following Jim <laughs> proactively three five years before he told us the solution, we followed his solution. Use machine learning to predict what his solution may be follow his suggestions. So we run the test and uh, we do that. So basically before the test run, we capture the heap, how the whole kind of dynamic uh, data structures look like, what are the objects, how they are connected and so on. One way or another, we serialize, we happen to use something called extreme library that creates uh, XML files. But you know, in principle, you can do that in any other way. Uh, we also captured the file system. We found that a number of these tests that pollute actually do it through files. Uh, maybe they create something database or some temporary files or something like that. Uh, the polluter creates that, doesn't properly clean, and then the victim comes and, and, and fails. Uh, and then when the test finishes, again, we captured that. And so for each of these tests, it tells you whether it's polluter or not. And if it is a polluter, we tell you where that pollution is. Maybe a certain file or directory got changed or maybe some part of heap is also modified. Now for heap, uh, well, you know, we have objects, uh, we have a kind of, we can view heap as a graph. So each of the nodes represents an object and then the edges between the, these objects represents the fields. So here, let's say I have these objects stored at some address, zero uh, X beef, and here's some of these fields outgoings here, G, F and P. So it has these three fields going out. Some of them point to string, some of them points to some primitive value here, some integer, and some other point to another object itself. And then these objects have more fields and then points to other objects and so on. So it's kind of very standard representation to view your heap as basically a graph. Again, nodes that represent objects and the edges represents fields between objects. We captured this before test runs when the test finishes. Um, we capture this again, and now we want to compare these two to figure out do they differ or not. So for that, we need to have somehow some definition of what it mean, mean means that they differ. And here we use graph isomorphism, basically checks whether these two graphs are isomorphic with respect to the identity of these objects. Uh, you can change the objects, things can be relocated, you know, garbage collection may run, move things and so on. Uh, but what you still want to check is whether these two graphs, when starting from these static roots, which is the point from which the states can differ and the, the part of the state that's actually shared across tests, 
uh, whether they have differences or not. Um, so we use that to check. And then again, if there are differences, we tell you uh, what is the path to that. If you find a situation like that, then there is no difference. So if just the identity of the objects changed, um, then there is actually no difference that these two things, you would find it hard to distinguish in regular Java program. It's possible, but it's unlikely. Um, if you do have differences, for example, here some field Y was null. That's why it's not even visible here. It was not pointing to anything. Now it does point to an object. Uh, if you find a difference like that, also some integer change here, 78 changed to 80, then the tool actually gives you a path and says you can start from this static root, you get to some object, and if when you follow F, you come to the difference, or here when you follow this H and then Y, you again get to a different part of the state. So it gives you these basically the paths from the static roots that you can name in the program to the parts of the heap where there are differences. Uh, some more challenges when you run this in Java, there's this thing called lazy class loading, which means that um, different parts of the execution do not have the same even set of classes that they talk about. It's only during execution that you find out what is that you need in your program, which classes you need, and then you load them. So what that means at the level of math is that you have these graphs that have different static roots. Um, during the execution of the test, you may have encountered new class, and that new class has a new root here. Mouse, we zoom. So it added a new root here, and now this points to some additional objects. Now, this makes the situation a bit trickier because whenever I compare these two, they would be always differing. It would always seem like whenever test runs, if it loads any one class, the states are different. But they don't care about that. What we care is, did your execution change some existing state? No, did it add new state? So what we actually do is some find what are the common roots and then just check the isomorphism from those common roots. So it ignores the newly added part of the state. So this part basically gets ignored and uh, it checks the rest. Let me see if I can hide this stuff. How do I hide this? Uh, I know how to hide this control in Zoom. Any questions about this comparing states is heap? Yes. Wouldn't you expect that a test case would change the state? Like, wouldn't, isn't, like how is that necessarily a solution? Uh, would I expect in what sense to add this thing or to no. change something existing 78 to 80? 78 to 80. Uh, well, I mean, you may or may not expect, I can show you the, the data in three slides. So everything's promised in three slides. Um, some number of tests do change state, some number doesn't. The question is, those that do, are they really problems that you want to address or not? Um, there are some other challenges here that we needed to address besides this, the lazy class loading, the common graph isomorphism and so on. Uh, one is if you capture the states at the really concrete level that they have, uh, you may get uh, too much information that you don't care about. Uh, suppose that we have some set where we have uh, uh, some, some, some elements before we start the test and maybe the execution of the test adds some value and removes the value. Now at the abstract level, at the end of the execution, the set is the same as before. It had some things, uh, maybe values uh, one, two, three, uh, sorry, not three, <laughs> one, two, and four. At the end of the execution, it's still going to have one, two, and four. Uh, but maybe this adding and removing has changed the concrete representation. If you use some red, black trees, you may have done some rotation and stuff and whatnot. So what you want to do is a bit to abstract this state when you compare the states to not look at the actual concrete representation, but at more at the abstract level. So basically we abstract some of that as invisible under the zoom control. The file system, Jim, you wanna guess how we do this one or? Or we should let someone else to guess. Oh, okay, how about someone else tells us? How would you compare the files? Before the test, we want to see how the file system looks like, and then after we want to check whether it got polluted. Any idea? Ah, okay, yes, yes, yes. Compare hashes. Uh, should have just sent the slides and not fly in. <laughs> yes, we hash the files right before. And we do that, as I said, sometimes uh, very often a simplest technique uh, can work the best. 
The only thing is we don't want to hash kind of the whole disk because it would take forever to traverse all the files, you know, find the slash and then find all the files from there. So we focus on a few directories in things like slash temp where tests often go and pollute. Uh, we look into the stuff like the current directory and the stuff underneath. We find the files, we hash them. At the end, we hash again. And then if you find that there are changes, then we just know that some of these files got polluted. So here's some of the, the results. I just now I really need to figure out how to move this. Oh, it's not that hard. OK. So here, we run this on some number of projects. So there were 6,000 tests in this uh, study. It's only about 5% of them were actually polluted. So it's not all that many that pollute. So basically what that means, 95% of these tests just left the state as they found it. So if you had the number 78, they left 78. They may have been reading from that state. They may have also through, through class loading, added some new classes and so on, but they were not polluting what existed there before. They may have done this, but not done that stuff where they change uh, whatever, 78 to 80 or change some pointers and so on. So that's 5% of them that pollute. But then the question is still, are they really polluting in such a way that as a developer, you would want to, to address? Do you really want to fix that or not? And so there we found that the, the number of true positives was about 200. So that's about two thirds of this test. It looks like you could reasonably write a victim that would fail. We know that we have a polluter and it changes the state in such a way that the reasonable victim can come and observe that quote unquote. So you would have another test that actually fails after this polluter. So the other 130 were basically false alarms um, where you do find that there are these pollutions, but you cannot reasonably write a normal test that would actually fail for that. Of course, we can write that test. We can write that in Java. I mean, that's how the tool finds that there is pollution. Uh, but it would be stuff like, you know, you're doing something like caching of the values or lazy initialization. So through the actual public API that's exposed, you cannot observe this difference. If you use caching, what that means, you know, when before the test, maybe cache was empty, the test did some computation and added something into the cache. But the cache is implemented in such a way that when you ask for a value, if it's not there, it will be computed and then returned. If it's there, it's going to return you what was computed before. So through the public API, you cannot really see is the cache empty or not. Of course, you can do it if you measure performance and see how fast it is to get back the result. Uh, what we actually use is some kind of private ways to go and uh, use reflection and traverse the whole state and observe that there is a difference there. Um, but there is no reasonable test that reasonable developer would want to write to actually check for this. So that's we view as a false positives for this tool. So basically, if all that is the tool then that helps to proactively detect these polluters with the goal to address them even before the problems arise later on, before you add the victims and before you run that pair in a way that it fails. And so our goal is to proactively detect these things. We just compare the states before and after, as you guessed, kind of in the straightforward way. And it found some uh, large number of the real polluters. Any questions about Paul that? Before I summarize. And you could also pollute the file system by changing that's an excellent question. I forgot what we do there. I think maybe for the directories, we just get the list of all file names or, or some timestamps or something. Uh, but yes, yes, you could kind of change. Yeah, I don't know what the tool does. If the file exists before the test and it doesn't exist after, I don't know whether it reports that or not. But the details, yes. Would it be possible to exempt the cache from the computer check? Yes, that, that will be somehow some way to try to change these things to understand that something is used as a cache or that you have a lazy initialization where kind of something is initially a null, but only when it's accessed, then you instantiate with an object and use it. Uh, yes, so uh, that, that would be the way to try to reduce the number of false positives. Uh, we did not explore that. Student uh, Hulad is graduated. <laughs> Projects going to dev null. <laughs> Once the students graduate, only the slides remain, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, uh, there's a lot of future work that can be done. As I said, uh, we are doing some of that, some of that not. Uh, other people in the community have done a lot of interesting work. For example, John Bell, he's done a lot of interesting work using advanced and static analysis to find these data dependencies between tests uh, and to figure out that you don't even need to try all of these pairs. You know, if one test writes to whatever X and Y and the other reads Z, they can never form a polluter victim pair. But if one writes to X and the other reads X, then they may be a polluter victim pair. So they've done a lot of interesting things there to find the data dependencies, potential issues, and so on, to reduce the search space, to search faster, and so on. I also, other people have done studies on you know, Python code, Gordon Fraser and his group, uh, and uh, people have looked into better fixing. Uh, nowadays, people use a lot of machine learning to predict the flaky tests, so basically. All our work is just you know, <laughs> creating data set for machine learning training <laughs> and evaluation. So they're getting also excellent results there in predicting whether tests are going to be flaky, just based kind of the source code of the tests, uh, based sometimes on the dynamic features from the execution, things like that. Here is some ongoing work that we have. I don't use machine learning, at least students yet did not drag me onto that bandwagon, so I'm resisting as much as I can, but it's impossible. Uh, so first I want to repeat that the fact that I presented all the dependent tests, those are not the only kind of flaky tests. There are many other kinds of flaky tests that I do not have you know, time to touch on. Uh, uh, so concurrence is rather prominent, uh, asynchronous wait, like basically you, know, you have some code that say launches some server, sends it the message and checks response, but maybe checks response too fast before the response even arrived. So that's a very common thing that we've seen for some other failures. Uh, random seed, again, I have some colleagues, uh, Saika Dutta, he'll be on the job market next year, I should pitch in for Saika. He's looked into flaky tests in machine learning. That's, he almost got me involved in that. He was not using machine learning, but he was checking machine learning programs. A lot of interesting work to find there due to randomness, some probabilistic things where they have flaky tests. So basically flaky test goes uh, very much broader than uh, what I presented. Uh, we have some work to try to fix more kinds of flaky tests. We have some upcoming paper at ICSI 2022. We're going to have the slides for that. I didn't want to get those slides to present. Uh, try to detect these flaky tests faster, not just for the, these polluters and so on, but for other kinds right when they're introduced. Some analytical analysis of order dependent tests. We sprinkled there some Greek letters and so on, proved some theorems. Sometimes you need that to publish papers. Uh, and then one thing that I'm particularly interested in, but uh, sometimes students are not, is just kind of non-determinism beyond this test, you know, like philosophical question. What does it mean that something is non-deterministic? You know, is it actually determinism that we don't understand? Like, you know, if a comet flies around the earth, do we think that it randomly appears or there is just some physical law that we don't understand how it appears? Uh, you know, the quantum computing, is it really non-deterministic or is it determinism that we cannot understand? Uh, um, so this topic gets raised up in some other cases, like in computational science, they talk about this reproducibility crisis. You run some experiments once, you get some result, then you go run it again and you don't get the same result. So, you know, oh, what happened and how are you going to deal with that? Um, so they're quite kind of interested in that topic. Um, so I also have some interest in that. We published some, some small paper on that. And uh, so my goal would be to understand more of the flakiness in, in some things like that. If I can find students who are interested to work in that or collaborators who wanna do that. So here's my last slide. And so we are getting to the full hour. So basically flaky tests are a big challenge in regression testing. I've showed at the beginning, all big large software organizations report those problems in blog posts, papers, you know, offer funding for that. Uh, my group has been working on that for, for a number of years. And uh, today I've just presented two of the things that we've done, and that's as much as I had time. Uh, one is to automatically fix uh, some order dependent tests. The other is to proactively detect order dependent tests. And uh, that's my summary. Have to leave it three. <laughs> yeah, so we are actually out of time. It's and people have been asking questions. So if you have any more questions, we have refreshments in the patio, and Dark will be there, so you can ask questions there. And once again, please join me thanking Darko for the excellent talk.
Thanks for all the questions. I'll be happy to take more either now while you sit or while we stand. Well, I'm already standing. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yes, there's a question. Uh, yeah. So uh, I actually had a question about the concept of quick recap. So okay. Basically, uh, in the beginning of the OS slide, the quick recap, uh, if I understand it correctly, it, uh, it is some failure in test cases that you don't have any changes in the code and then don't have any changes in the test cases, right? And then one concept you introduced later is that the order dependency about the test cases. Uh, as Jim mentioned, I, 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 I do also believe that some bad practice was done by uh, developers. So, uh, but, but, but when that kind of failure occurred, isn't there's a change in the in test cases, so it isn't it's, is that the, is that that can come as a flaky pass? Because there's actually a change, right? No, it's it's an excellent question. Kind of, what's the definition of flaky tests? What's the definition of non deterministically failed? I've had many discussions with people about that topic. Something has to change, right? If sometimes it's true and sometimes it's false, something did change, right? Whether it's the order of the tests. Suppose that I'm using random numbers to generate some simulation of something. If I give you one result, like you know, predict the number of COVID cases, and then I run the simulation again and give you another result, something has changed, right? My random seed was different, and that led to a different execution. So something has to change for this test to be true and false. The only question is how easy it's for developer to know what was that thing that they changed, or how easy they can control that source of non-returns. That's why here it says kind of the test environment is in the quote, the same. The test environment is not exactly the same. However, that your test code interacts with some environment, it actually is getting somewhat different results. And that must be the case, right? Because the, the code cannot itself create a non determinism It has to have the source of non determinism coming from somewhere. Okay. Like, uh, I'm going to be pretty rusty since I had like testing class a couple years back. But uh, my, my so, so as I, this concept is new to me, it feels like it's something like sharing your test case. So sometimes it's, it's a pass, sometimes it's a fail. So, uh, so it still is a, so, so uh, the new explanation is that they, they are running on the same environment, but something is changing beyond the knowledge of the, the developers, right? Yes. Okay. I mean, something must change to get a different outcome, right? You know, your code as such is deterministic, right? Uh, uh, until it starts doing something, right? It's either I say concurrent code, and then you know the some OS scheduler or something, you know, does the things and and creates different interleavings of the threads, and that leads to non-determinism, or your code is talking and asking for the time of the day, or it's talking with the network. It must, you know, execute some things that create the source of non-determinism. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, yeah, feel free to leave. I know you said no. to leave. Yes. Uh, I have a question. So, should, should we focus on the test cases that always pass, but they have different coverage information? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes. If you have the tests that you run multiple times and it always pass, but say you measure the coverage and you find that it covers different things, that it means that it does have some non determinism Maybe it yet did not manifest in a failure. It may be in the future, it will become failing. Uh, we did not explore this, does it in the future become a failing test or not? But we did study how much uh, non determinism there is in, in, in coverage. And there is a, indeed some significant amount. You can just get the same test suite and run twice and uh, the thing can differ two, three, five percent even uh, between different runs. Yes, I think if you just use that as the only measure to guide, should you fix the test or not, you just get too many false alarms. You just simply say almost any test when you run twice, it could change the coverage. And uh, it will not be sure that you really want to fix that. Jim doesn't believe that almost any test can change coverage. I'm trying to think of why. <laughs> so, I mean, why would it change? Why would you have test coverage that changes? That would be a false alarm. That would be. Uh, uh, like that would be a sign that the behavior is changing for some reason that's not. Sure, I mean, it's, yeah, so suppose I, uh, I just, you know, run an application that gets current time of the day and writes that right. into some log. Okay. You know, I get some current time of the day as some number, I need to translate that into some ASCII string that I write somewhere 
you know, at the different time, I mean, we're getting different digits, different case switch statements execute, different if then elses for me to produce that different things that I save in the log. Yet from some, you know, perspective, is this correct or not? Is this doing the right thing? You just ignore that and say, yes, this is fine. I wanted the current time to be written in the log. Okay, thank you everyone again.